So there's a story told of a young teenage boy by the name of Jimmy. And Jimmy was outside playing hurling and he got this kind of a pain in his leg. And so I'm thinking to his mom, I said, Mom, there's something wrong with my leg. It's just got this pain. It's kind of, a, it's, it's, it's been, I've got to have this dull pain there for about a month actually, but just today it's just bad. Like, So she said, look, it'll be fine. It's just a bit of a sprain. It'll be grand. But after a week, it still wasn't gone. So she decides to bring him to the doctor. Doctor organizes a scan. And lo and behold, they discover that he has uh, cancer. So he's got uh, a cancerous tumor in the leg. So they say, look, he's going to need, it's going into the, back, the bone marrow. So we, we're going to need um He's going to need blood. Uh, he's going to need a, a blood transfusion. So they said, look, if you don't mind, we'll just do a blood test of the members of your family and we'll see then who has the uh, same blood type and we'll see what we can do. So they do the, 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 the blood test of the family and they discover that uh, Jimmy's younger brother, Tom, 12 years of age, actually has the same blood type. So uh, they bring Tom into a room. They say, Tom, um, we've got something to ask you. It's... Uh, it's, it's pretty serious, as you know, Jimmy's sick. Yeah, I saw Jimmy was sick. Yeah, Jimmy's going to need your help. Uh, Jimmy's going to need uh, some of your blood. So uh, would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to, to go into the hospital and they'll attach you to a machine and then they'll be able to, to, to give uh, him your blood? And, Jim, and, and Tom looks a bit serious and he kind of frowns, as kids do when they're thinking, as some of our young people here do as well. And uh, he frowns and he says... Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So they bring him into the hospital, and you've got Tom on one side after his surgery, and you've got no, hang on, you've got Jimmy on one side after his surgery. You've got Tom on the other side, and the nurses come in and they're setting up up all the the, the various drips and needles and curtains and things. And then little Tom looks at his mom and he says, "Mom, um, after they put in the needle." How long is it going to be before I die? His understanding was that he would have to give everything. That he would have to give all of his blood to his brother and he was willing to do it. When he gave that yes, he gave a complete yes. When I hear those kind of stories uh, of that kind of courage, I think of... The, the longer version of, of uh, today's gospel, actually, where Jesus is on the cross and uh, the soldiers come around to break the legs of the various prisoners of the two men crucified with Jesus. When they get to Jesus, they see he's already dead. And so they pierce his side and then from his heart flows blood and water. No blood left. No blood left. Jesus gave everything. Completely emptied himself for love of us. And not only does he empty himself, he gives everything he has. Like all that exists, all of creation is for us. He even gives us his own mom. It's the, the reading of today. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to her, Woman, behold your son. So she's, she's our mom. Then to his disciple, he says, Behold your mother. And I think it can be that the church goes through uh, a kind of a, like a teenage phase. You know, when we're kids, when we're kids, our moms know everything. I remember when I was, when I was young, we'd watch the nine o'clock news. Uh, all the family would gather around the TV. It was great. And uh, so then Jerry Adams would come on and I'd be like, Mommy, is he good or bad? I won't say what the answer was, but like, do you know, Ava, then, do you know or like Tony Blair would come on, is he good or bad? And she'd have these simple questions like, are they a goodie or a baddie kind of thing, you know? Uh, and mom and mom, they, they knew everything. They knew everything. They knew absolutely everything, sure. Uh, you hung in there every word. And then when you get to like, your teenage years, like, you know nothing. I mean, you don't even know what TikTok is. <laughs> Have you even got a TikTok page, account, thing? No, you don't. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah, when you get to your teens then, and this is kind of a natural part of, of human development, where in our... In our childhood, we need to stick by our parents for our survival. They're the ones who provide food and shelter and protection. But then when we get to our teenage years, like, we actually need to learn how to survive out there because that's where we're going to have to go eventually. And so the opinion of our peers is far more important to us than, than the opinion of our parents because we will leave our parents, but with our peers, they're the ones we're going to marry. They're the ones we're going to be working with. They're the ones we're going to be spending our lives with out there. So it's kind of a natural part of, of human development that in our teenage years, uh, the opinion of our peers mat 
matters much, much more to us. This, the ugly effect of that, though, can actually be a kind of embarrassment of our parents. One story, if I may. So I went to my first underage disco. It was great. There was lots of coke. And uh, so it was on in, in an actual like nightclub, uh, but we, we were all, it was for over 15s. So the place was jammers with all these teeny boppers uh, dancing to YMCA and doing the Macarena, uh, cutting the floor, dance floor up, it was great. And um, so then it ended at I think 12 o'clock or something decent like that. And uh, so we were, we were leaving and there was a, it was very slow getting out. You know, there was a cloakroom on the way out, so people were getting up, getting, picking up their handbags and jackets and things, but it was much slower than usual. Like it was just, it was something jammed up. So we were taking our time, mate, we were having the crack anyway, so we were just making our way out. And uh, then lo and behold, once I got to the door, I saw what the obstruction was. It was my mom who, <laughs> who had parked the car that close to the door. Now, it, it was late and Mam had decided to get a little rest before she came in, in the car. So she was, she was wearing a pink dressing gown <laughs> and curlers. <laughs> and uh, so I came out the door and I just kind of kept walking. <laughs> just, just, who's that? <laughs> just, just kept going, just kept going, waiting in the crowd. And she's like, honey, <laughs> honey. Talking to what? Who is this person? And uh, so I went to the crowd left, <laughs> snuck back to the cab. Mom, can't park here. So yes, we so now they come. We we can go through this phase where we be, we can be kind of embarrassed of our parents, sometimes rightly so. Um, but but it, 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 as I say it's kind of an ugly phase at times where where you know our parents something wrong with our parents, but we can just be kind of embarrassed by them. Um, and this can happen in the church too, where as we become kind of maybe, as we consider ourselves more theologically advanced, these kind of simple devotions like the rosary and stations of the cross and chaplet, all these kind of, you know, oh, anything, anything that's printed by tan, oh, oh it's a tan book, whoopie do, um, you know, anything that's kind of considered devotional is just kind of rejected because we're, we're, way, we're way more advanced. I've read Carol Ranner. <laughs> You know, who needs the rosary? Who needs, like, St. Thomas Aquinas when you've got skillybecks? Uh, and it just this kind of arrogance can creep in where these divine decisions, like what, what the Lord is doing on the cross here, this is important. The Lord is in his dying moments on the cross here. And what he chooses to say, at great physical pain, because he would have had to push himself up on a nail to speak. And the words he chooses to say, or behold your mother. Behold your mother. Because this, this, this isn't just a throwaway comment or observation or theological nicety. This is something real that the Lord wants to establish in his church, in his family, in his mystical body. That's us. That as Mary gave birth to Jesus' humanity, so in, in, in the church... She is our mother. This is, a, this is a spiritual reality, not just a kind of a devotional nicety or decoration. Our Lady is the mother of the church. And that's, again, sometimes can feel a bit abstract. The church is made up of people, you and I. So Mary's mother of a church means Mary is my mom because I'm a member of the church. We're like various organs, various cells in this mystical body. Now, I can't say like, you know, this, you know, par each cell in your body only has one mom. I mean, there's no other way. It's just the way it works. So Our Lady then is, is the mother of each cell, each organ, each component, each soul in the church, in the spiritual order. So this is this is a great truth that, that we, we should never lose sight of. And as I say, if the church, maybe, or some members of the church or some theologians go through this kind of teenage phase of being embarrassed by the simplicity of Marian devotion or something like that, they're wrong. They're wrong. And just like I would hope, most of us then, after that teenage phase has passed and we hit our, our 20s, and especially when you have your first kids and you go back to your mom for advice and you realize, my goodness, 
I was right when I was six. She's a genius. She knows so much about raising kids. How did you, how did you bring up five of us? I've only got one. This is head wrecking. I haven't slept in three months. And she, you know, get used to it, love. And, then, and all the advice will come, and the, you know how to wind them, and what what does colic look like, and all this kind of thing. And the 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 the, the, the genius, the, the 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 wisdom of your mom will be revealed in later years when maturity comes. And so I think in, in, in the spiritual life, as we become actually more mature, not, it's not the opposite. It's not, it's not that, it's not that when the more infantile we become or the more kind of stupid we become in the faith, the more these devotions appeal to us. No, I think the, the deeper we get, the more profoundly united we are with Jesus, her son, the more we begin to recognize the greatness of the saints, the greatness of, of, of the mass, the greatness of Our Lady, the more mature we become in our faith, the more these become life-giving. Just as Jesus on, on the way of the cross uh, was so consoled by the presence of his mom. And just in, the, in, in a similar way that these big burly fishermen who hit, headed for the hills when the going got tough and this petite little Jewish lady hung around to console her son. This, 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 the greatness of Our Lady in her simplicity, the greatness of Our Lady in her humility, the greatness of Our Lady in her profound love. How much we can learn from her and how much we will learn from her. From that moment, the disciple took her into his home. We ask today that our Blessed Lady, Virgin Mother of the Church, may we take her into our home, into our heart, into our prayer life. So that when we're kneeling in prayer or driving and we're praying, when we're contemplating scripture, whatever it may be, that we may do so through the eyes of Our Lady, as such, sitting on Our Lady's lap, trying to discover who Jesus is and how much love and adoration he deserves. May we do so at the guidance of Our Lady the mother of the church. Amen.